So I am mostly a, a Middle East analyst, but uh, I'm here to learn about all the different things that Pacific Strategies and Assessments does in Asia and replicate some of that in the Middle East, hopefully. Uh, but it's, it happens to be a good time to be a, a Middle East analyst in the Philippines by chance because of all the attention that ISIS has been getting. So my goal here is to synthesize all the expertise and information that we have available to us as a company about these movements in the Philippines. As mentioned, most of our directors have been here for over 20 years, and we have a great deal of sources and, and, and historical information. And then, but put that into some kind of global context and comparative context to what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, so, let me make sure this, yeah, okay. So, regarding ISIS in the Philippines, there's been a great deal of irresponsible, both reporting in the media and analysis. Uh, so this first quote is from Time Magazine, and essentially what they did is they republished an ISIS press release as if it was true, to say that 100 Philippine soldiers had been killed in Basilan, and the Philippine military, according to them, it's, it was 18. So it, again, it's, it's pretty irresponsible to republish the ISIS version of events as if it's true without uh, challenging it and without publishing the Philippine military version. Uh, and the second statement is what I would consider irresponsible analysis, to allege that there's a network of camps in the Philippines, or that somehow the Philippines is central for the transit of Southeast Asian fighters to Iraq and Syria. There's no evidence of that, and this statement is made by a reputable analyst without, as if it's true. So I think part of the reason why these kind of statements come out in the media and in analysis is because a lot of analysis regarding ISIS and regarding ISIS in the Philippines is driven by propaganda. And one of my challenges today is there was quite a significant piece of propaganda issued by ISIS. And my, one of my challenges myself is to not republish that or redistribute that as if it's fact. But how do you balance the importance of propaganda, which is very deliberate by ISIS to, to, meet, to, to send a message? How do you balance that in your analysis? So hopefully I'm going to do a, a good job of that today, considering some of the recent things that have been said. Uh, but our bottom line up front, in the military I was always taught that you give a simple statement about what you're going to say, what your analytical judgment is. And our bottom line is that the, res the relationship between ISIS and groups here in the Philippines, of which there are many that have pledged to ISIS, is it's a symbolic relationship, and it is one based upon communications. So the communications are open, uh, but that does not mean that there is command and control, that ISIS can issue directives which groups here in the Philippines follow. Uh, so I, very briefly, I just have to discuss some, some vocabulary. I'm going to be using the term ISIS today. That's not necessarily the most uh, academically correct term. The most academically correct term is probably something like the Islamic State, but it's not uh, considered a good term to use because it, it conveys some legitimacy. Some of the other terms that have been used by President Obama, for example, are ISIL in Arabic. Uh, the Islamic, or ISIS is often referred to as Daesh, but we're just going to use ISIS today for colloquial value. All right, so to introduce the groups that are relevant here in the Philippines. The most important is Abu Sayyaf, of which it's a very factionalized organization with different cells. So we're talking about Isnalan Hapilan, most importantly, uh, Radalan Sahiran, and Hatib uh, Suwaja'an. Uh, there are other groups that have, are associated with ISIS through pledges, but have not been acknowledged, such as Basmur Islamic Freedom Fighters, uh, Ustaz Kato made a, made a pledge. He's dead now, so it's not clear what relationship exists because these pledged relationships are very personal in nature. Uh, Ansar Khalifa in the Philippines is kind of a difficult organization to pin down because it's a name that's used a lot, but it's a small radical organization in Serengani uh, uh, and that southern part of Mindanao. And then also importantly is the Maute group whose name is changing on a regular basis. Uh, most recently, they've referred to themselves as the Islamic State in, in Renau, referring to Lanao del Norte and Lanao del Sur. Uh, so, for some historical and kind of global context, I have to talk about Al-Qaeda, and then I'm going to move back to ISIS. So, the, the affiliate structure of Al-Qaeda is very clear. There are five recognized affiliates, 
Uh, I'm going to try to refer to them by their colloquial names again, uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, Al-Qaeda in Syria, things like that. But it's important to remember that ISIS started as one of these affiliates, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and then moved on to challenge Al-Qaeda for dominance of the, the global movement. The, the affiliate structure of ISIS, there's two really important concepts to understand. One is the concept of the, the pledge. In Arabic, it's bay'a. And individuals throughout the world, starting in summer of 2013, began making pledges to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, saying, we recognize you as leader. We are loyal to you, right? <clears throat> and then with that pledge, ISIS has a, a choice. It can respond to the pledge and acknowledge it. It can republish it. It can reference the pledge in a speech made by a senior official, and that, at that point, is then considered acknowledged. Uh, beyond that, another important concept is the concept of wilayat. So what ISIS has done is they've, they've taken some of those uh, organizations that have pledged, and they say, now within this territory abroad, outside of Iraq and Syria, you represent us. You are the government of the Islamic State in this part of Libya or this part of a Yemen. And this is what that represents. So in black, these are all the provinces of ISIS that have been declared. Now, that does not mean that ISIS actually controls that territory, but it means they have one organization that they have recognized which other groups within that territory are we're supposed to pledge to and are supposed to have some, there's supposed to be some kind of command and control. With the recent changes in the propaganda over the last couple months, there's a strong argument that the Philippines should be in black because of the attention that has been given by the propaganda organizations to uh, Isnalan Hapilan and his faction of Abu Sayyaf in Basilan. That doesn't mean that anything in reality has changed on the ground in the Philippines. It just means the way that ISIS and ISIS propaganda organizations are talking about the Philippines has changed. So to talk specifically about the groups and, and how they relate to, in terms of the pledge, all of the pledges that have been made that have been acknowledged by ISIS are uh, related to uh, uh, Hapilan's faction in Basilan. And it, including the most recent pledges that were made two days ago. Uh, there are a variety of other groups, though, that have pledged and have not been acknowledged. So the Maute group in, in Lanao, for example. The, at some points, the Basmore Islamic Freedom Fighters. Um, <clears throat> and then even within Abu Sayyaf, there's an interesting category of groups that use the symbols of ISIS, but there's no record of them having made the pledge. So the, the group in Sulu that's most associated famously with the kidnapping or infamously, uh, they, they fall into that category in a very in kind of interesting way. So I think when we're talking about the groups here, one of the things that becomes apparent is, is that there are certain global aspects that are being reflected in what's happening now in the Philippines. So in, in the early 1990s and 2000s, uh, Al-Qaeda was known primarily as a slow, uh, organization in terms of its communications, right? Very secretive in nature, and now we're seeing very open communications across consumer-grade programs like WhatsApp. Notably, Telegram is, is the most popular way that jihadist organizations communicate right now. Uh, Telegram is a lot like WhatsApp, but less well-known. Uh, in, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, Al-Qaeda was known for very infrequent media production, long statements by by bin Laden, and now there's a great deal of frequent, high-quality media production by ISIS-affiliated groups and Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups. Uh, Al-Qaeda was primarily a funding organization. It is extremely difficult to conduct terrorist financing right now. The environment is much more difficult, and so typically what you see is locally financed groups, primarily through criminal activity, in the Middle East, there's also a lot of taxation, taxation of oil production and things like our regular commerce that finances organizations like this when they, when they control territory and govern it. Uh, Al-Qaeda was capable of funding and planning transnational attacks, and that's n not really what's happening now. Mostly now it's calls for lone wolf attacks and local objectives by affiliates. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 
Al-Qaeda was capable of moving high-quality operatives all around the world. So I think if you ask who was the most capable jihadi or terrorist operative ever to be in the Philippines, you'd have to say someone like Ramzi Yusuf. And people like that do not move freely around the world anymore. It's a much more diff uh, difficult environment to move. So what we see are uh, individuals that move along regional networks. <clears throat> so when you're talking about ISIS, you have to really talk about one of the most important things is the flow of individuals to Iraq and Syria to fight there. This is a, it's a religious mandate. And you see huge numbers from Europe, from North America. Uh, it's not an exact science, but all these numbers here are done according to the same methodology, right? So we're talking hundreds of fighters from Europe, thousands from the Middle East. In the Philippines, we're talking about very low numbers. So the estimates are two to 100. And two is kind of an odd number, right? Because it's very specific. So when you look at the actual credible cases, there, there's not very credible cases at all. Until two days ago, this was the best example. An individual who spoke in a kind of Bahasa, mixed heavily with, with Arabic. It, so you can, you can guess reasonably that he's from the Sulu region, but he might be from Indonesia, he might be from Malaysia, he might be from the Philippines. With, with, with the propaganda that was released two days ago, there's a better candidate. But still, we're only talking about two people. The, the individual two days ago spoke a very uh, comfortable Tagalog. So he's a much stronger candidate as actually being from the Philippines. Um, but the, the, the lack of flow of fighters from the Philippines to the Iraq and Syria, the importance of it can't be understated because it has a direct operational impact. If you look at the attack in Jakarta in January and compare it to the attack in, in, in Paris in November, the difference is the presence of trained fighters who spent time in Iraq and Syria. And that's why Jakarta was a failure and Paris was such a massive attack. And, and also these personal relationships Historically, they're the basis of future international organizations. So Al-Qaeda has its roots in the Afghan Jihad and all the transnational movement to, to Afghanistan in the 1980s. ISIS really has its roots in that transnational movement to Iraq, 2003 to 2011, when I was there. And in many ways, the Philippines is missing out on the future of the jihadi movement because it doesn't have a strong presence in these relationships. Uh, so what about the other direction? fighters to the Philippines. Uh, these are kind of the, the most important uh, foreign fighters or Filipinos that have spent time abroad that have come back after. Um, I think there's a couple things that are apparent. We're talking about regional networks. We're talking about people from Malaysia and Indonesia. Typically what happens is a cell is broken up by the security forces there and they flee here to the Philippines, right? So regional networks, I think another thing that's very important is, is that the Philippine security services are regularly degrading these networks. You know, four of the five uh, up here are, are, are sorry, four, uh, five of the six have been killed in action. And Amin Bako, the one that's still at large, is kind of the most wanted man in the southern Philippines right now. So you can contrast this to the, the Middle East and in the Middle East, ISIS has the capacity to send high-level operatives to Sinai, to Libya, to create relationships, to represent them there. <clears throat> and there's a great deal of exchange of expertise. I think um, <clears throat> that when you're talking about terrorist organizations, you can't underestimate the interpersonal exchange. In the military, we say that 80 to 90% of training happens in the unit, not in an academy, not in electronic sources. And I think it's very similar with terrorist organizations, that the interpersonal exchange of expertise is very important. And that's not happening here, largely. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've seen no significant jump in terms of capability. W typically, what you see in the Philippines, you see IEDs from repurposed mortar shells. There's no jump in terms of capability from the groups here that we've seen over the years. All right, so in, in terms of exchange of equipment and supply, it's very clear that Mindanao and the Sulu region is at the center of a smuggling network. And that smuggling includes arms, it includes a variety of things. So it's open in that regard. But in terms of funding, it's very difficult to move money right now for terrorist organizations. All that we see are small amounts of money from maybe the family of a Malaysian who's fled here, for example. Uh, we do not see international dispatches of funding from the Middle East to Southeast Asia. It's all local funding. 
So the, what we do know, though, is that there are communications, and social media is really important. So this is the communications and social media model. And what you have is you have groups in the Philippines that produce a video. They post it online, largely through Telegram, which is what the red lines represent. Telegram is kind of the favored means of communication for the jihadi movement right now. It's a lot like WhatsApp. It has 100 million downloads. <clears throat> and uh, it's considered more secure amongst the jihadi community than, than a program like WhatsApp. So Abu Sayyaf produces a video. They distribute it to a recognized ISIS media organization, which may be anywhere in the world. And then it gets distributed through the larger network of across Telegram to what we're calling the wider jihadist network. And then it goes to social media. It goes to the analysts, the open source analysts, which is how it usually, it, when it does make it to the media, it makes it through those channels. Uh, it, when ISIS was operating in Iraq and Syria in 2014, it had a very strong presence on social media. Uh, now that, uh, that environment is much more difficult. Typically on Twitter, ISIS followers have only several hundred followers, where 2014 they might have had 10,000. So this is an example of that. There's a pledge video from March in 2016. It was produced by an, an Abu Sayyaf group here in the Philippines. It went to El Farat Media Foundation, and then from there it went to the, what we're calling the wider network. What you see is, you see 15 to 45 seconds of media production. This is essentially the introduction by the ISIS media organization El Farat, right? It's, it's associated with a province in Iraq and Syria, but they produce a lot of international media. So that's what it, an ISIS media introduction looks like. And then we're going to go to the pledge that's made here in the Philippines. So then this symbolic relationship is very high, right? So this pledge here is the same pledge that's made in the Middle East, almost word for word. I mean, the, the Arabic is better in the Middle East, but it's, it's the symbolic relationship is high in this case. And they're pledging to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi using his extended name there. Uh, so the communications are open, right? But this is not a Philippine problem. This is a global problem. This is largely the same system that inspires attacks in Europe for by terrorist cells or lone wolf attacks in the United States. I think it is important to note that we don't know how widely this kind of propaganda is being consumed in the Philippines. Uh, here's another example. In this case, it came straight from ASG in Sulu to, G, uh, to Telegram, to the wider network, and it was not touched by an by a ISIS media organization, if you will. So if you could just click on the, on the video again. Tingnan mo kung hindi mo binibigay yung ransom namin, puputulan ko ng ulo yung sifu ka na dyan. Pati ikaw kung manhuli kita, puputulan kita rin ng ulo. So it's not in Arabic, it's not, uh, there's no flag, there's no orange jumpsuit. The more recent execution which occurred is had more symbolism. Uh, so this is something that has kind of changed, but typically what we used to see is that you'd see a, uh, a Abu Sayyaf video that had maybe 15 seconds of an ISIS media organization introduction, and it did not have the sophisticated model up top that I'm describing. When you, when you talk about jihadist propaganda, I think the most effective ones are where they frame an attack, and it's very sophisticated. It tries to provide a global geopolitical context. It moves into a local context. It covers the intelligence and preparation of the attack and then it covers the attack itself often in very sophisticated ways. I mean, I was watching a uh, piece of propaganda where Al-Qaeda in Syria covered a suicide attack with drones in the air and cameras and covering it from different angles. And then they'll cover the aftermath of the attack maybe with interviews of prisoners or executions. Now there are organizations that are producing propaganda on behalf of Abu Sayyaf that is of this quality. So this is recent. Uh, 
that does not mean that Abu Sayyaf is producing it or has that kind of capability, but there are people on the internet producing things about Abu Sayyaf that represent this top level of, of complexity. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting question analytically to say that we don't see command and control if there are open communications. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine it on three levels. Um, <clears throat> at kind of at the theoretical level, when you have decentralized communications, you don't see command and control. That's the default. What you see is individuals that have differing levels of influence. And then if you wanted to spot some kind of leadership amongst a decentralized network, you'd look for statements issued by one group that another group follows or some kind of action that simultaneously uh, starts up amongst different groups, right? But that's not, that's not really what we see here in the Philippines. Um, and then kind of from the global context of the jihadi movement, there's, there's not, it's not really characterized by strong command and control, even amongst an organization like Al-Qaeda, for example. What we're seeing now, uh, globally is very independent affiliates that are, that are conducting local objectives. They're spreading their influence locally. It's very different environment than what we saw previously in the 1990s, for example. And I think a great example of that is how the actual split between ISIS and Al-Qaeda played out, right? So uh, there had been increasing tensions between uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Al-Qaeda Central. Uh, <clears throat> it kind of reached the point of all-out war in 2014. And at this point, uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria are they're killing each other, they're launching suicide attacks against each other. The other Al-Qaeda affiliates are very slow to respond to this, right? They, they renew their pledge to uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri in Pakistan, but they don't uh, respond to, uh, altogether condemning ISIS. They slowly do that as the local situation in their country changes. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen was uh, is generally considered the closest affiliate to Al-Qaeda Central in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And it took them eight months to condemn ISIS, despite that fact. And when they did, they did it for very local reasons, because the competition in Yemen was heating up. So, and then at the local level, uh, Abu Sayyaf is not a hierarchical organization that has command and control amongst itself. We're talking about different cells with different leaders that have influence locally, and sometimes they cooperate across island groups, but uh, it's not a hierarchical organization. There's not a salary. There's not a, uh, a <clears throat> HR department. Uh, and we don't, we've already talked about how we don't see ISIS dispatching operatives or funding that would reinforce any kind of hierarchical structure. Uh, so on, a, on the ideological level, at times the symbolism is very high, right? But also the symbolism that is used fits very strongly into the kinds of extortion activities that groups here in the Philippines are known for conducting. They're not associated with terrorist attacks, primary, uh, they're, they're associated with financing operations through extortion, through kidnap and ransom. And uh, the majority of, of that activity is financially motivated, even when they produce quite terrifying propaganda. Uh, on the individual level, we, we do believe that recruitment is primarily driven by individual financial desires, by poverty in the region. And uh, there, I think this is an important point, is that there is a historical absence of suicide bombings in the Philippines. So you do not see the kind of hopeless attacks where the, the attackers do not expect to survive. Uh, it's quite different from the Middle East where uh, the complex suicide attack is really the height of operational capability, not just in terms of terrorist attacks, but in terms of attacks on the battlefield. Uh, so the kind of the global difference, I think there's some obvious ones. Uh, the groups here have significantly less operational capability, right? They're not launching complex attacks. They don't govern territory the way some of the groups in the Middle East do. And they have, there's much smaller groups. We're talking 50 to 200 people uh, and e despite some of the, the things that have been said, we don't see any of them are, have much higher manpower either. Uh, in terms of differences, uh, the, uh, argu it's arguable to say that we've reached the stage of having a, a, a walayat, but uh, it's been two years since Isnilan Hapilan first declared his allegiance to ISIS, and it's taken a very long time 
for Hopilon to get attention from the organization. Now, I think that speaks to the weakness of the groups here in the Philippines. Um, there's no flow of fighters to Iraq and Syria, no dispatch for, of, of operatives or emissaries from ISIS, and the, the quality of the propaganda is still lower, and no suicide attacks on, at all. <clears throat> Uh, so again, the, the bottom line is that the relationship is symbolic. There is communications, but there's uh, no command and control. That's it. <laughs>